Hello friends, today I'm going to be reading Sutta number 62 from the Majima Nikaya, the Middle Length Discourses. If there was only one book I had in my library, it would be this one, uh, mostly because it has uh, the most uh, varied um, topic, topical matters. It uh, gives uh, contextual settings with the deepest and most comprehensive assortment of teachings. Uh, Middle meaning not too long, not too short, uh, so you can generally get through a discourse um, in about uh, maybe five minutes and then you can spend 25 minutes pondering that and in a half an hour you've done a, you've done a good thing. I'd like to give you some background for this particular uh, discourse. Uh, it was taught to Rahul when he was 18 years old, it's believed, for the purpose of dispelling a desire connected with the household life. Uh, the way the story goes is that uh, the Buddha was going out uh, for alms rounds and uh, his son Rahula was behind him. And so as he was following him, he noted, you know, with admiration, his physical perfection and he started thinking of himself uh, having a similar appearance. And he says, um, you know, uh, the Buddha is handsome, and I too am handsome, like my father, you know. And and the Buddha, mind wrapping mind, read his thoughts, and he turned to him, and uh, he admonished him at once, uh, before these vain thoughts led him into greater difficulty. And so the Buddha framed his advice in terms of contemplating the body as neither self nor the possession of a self. Um, now later, uh, when the Buddha, when the Buddha's son was sitting there meditating, Sariputta came and uh, gave him an instruction on mindfulness of breathing, assuming that's the meditation that he was uh, doing, not realizing that the Buddha had already uh, chastised him, and he was really sitting there to reflect on something else, on the actually on the chastisement, and so uh, uh, Rahula asked. Uh, the Buddha, how to do mindfulness of breathing that would be of good benefit and good result. And so the reason why I think that this suit is so important is because sometimes, you know, I'll tell you the truth, meditation is kind of like uh, taking a medicine. So if I have a, a headache, I might actually have a head ache or something else could be wrong with me. And the body and the mind, the head is registering that uh, that illness or that dis-ease or that difficulty. And so I might take the aspirin in both situations and one, it relieves the head ache and I'm done. And on the other hand, it might relieve the symptom of something else wrong with me that is manifesting or that's showing up as a headache. And we have to really know the difference. And so uh, when we think of meditation, we need to think about uh, a remedy for what ails us. I mean, we're not like just sitting down, closing our eyes, hmm, shanti, shanti, we're not doing a um, letting go for a while, uh, deep relaxation, uh, getting over that person that upset you today. It's not about all of those kinds of things, but it's really going deeply into uh, an exploration of who and what we are and um, uh creating a shift in the way that um, thoughts and views, uh, opinions, appearances uh, form for us. So it's really like a washing of the mind, uh, and we do that with the instruction of the meditation uh, teacher and the instructions for the meditation. So I'm going to read to you Sutta 62. This is uh, the advice of the Buddha. It's not Paniwadi. And, uh, and, and keeping in mind that mindfulness of breathing is wonderful, mindfulness meditation is wonderful, but the Buddha was dealing with him about something specific that had to do with his uh, 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 vanity, his, uh, 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 an overly, um, uh, he had too much of a sense of himself.
You know, and, and this can show up in many ways. It even shows up with people who want to be helpful or people who, who want to serve. You know, there's this thought, I am serving. And so in a certain way, there is still so much ego tied up in that. And there is, uh, there is a kind of vanity that comes off as a righteousness, a self-righteousness even. Sometimes it is uh, just being unbalanced. It is good to do for others. It is good to take care of, of things that we need to take care of for ourselves. Some people are so uh, uh, eager uh, to to please others, you know, or or they are so uh, interested in serving others, but there is still this notion that they are serving, and so there's still more work to be done. So let's go into this Sutta and see what the Buddha uh, has to say. Thus have I heard, on one occasion, the Blessed One was living at Savati in Jeddah's Grove and Apendika's Park. Then when it was morning, the Blessed One dressed and taking his bowl and outer robe, went into Savati for arms. And the Venerable Rahula also dressed and taking his bowl and outer robe, followed close behind the Blessed One. And then the Blessed One looked back and addressed the Venerable Rahula thus, Rahula, any kind of material form, whatever, whether past, future, or present, internal or external, gross or subtle, inferior or superior, far or near, all material form should be seen as it actually is with proper wisdom. Thus, this is not mine, this I am not, this is not myself. And there is that mind wrapping mind and seeing the pride that, uh, that was in Rahula's mind about uh, the Buddha and being the Buddha's son. Only material form, blessed one, only material one, sublime one, material form, Rahula, and feeling, and perception, and formations, and consciousness. And then the venerable Rahula considered thus, who would go into town for alms today when personally admonished? by the Blessed One. And thus he turned back, and he sat at the root of a tree, folding his legs crosswise, setting his body erect, and establishing mindfulness in front of him. And the Venerable Sariputta saw him sitting there and addressed him thus, Rahula, develop mindfulness of breathing. When mindfulness of breathing is developed and cultivated, it is of great fruit and great benefit. And then when it was evening, the venerable Rahula rose from his meditation, and he went to the Blessed One. And after paying homage to him, he sat down at one side, and he asked the Blessed One, Venerable Sir, how is mindfulness of breathing developed and cultivated so that it is of great fruit and of great benefit? Now remember, this was morning. They was going out on alms rounds, right? And when the Buddha chastised him, he turned around and went back and sat at the root of the tree. He's been meditating all day now. It's evening. And he gets up and he goes, uh, he hasn't figured it out. And he goes and asks the Buddha, how do I um, meditate? How, do I, how is the mindfulness of breathing developed and cultivated? So it is of great fruit and great benefit. And the Buddha said to him, Rahula, whatever internally belonging to oneself is solid, solidified and clung to, that is, head hairs, body hairs, nails, teeth, skin, flesh, sinews, bones, bone marrow, kidneys, heart, liver, diaphragm, spleen, lungs, intestines, uh, large and small, contents of the stomach, feces, or whatever else is internally belonging to oneself that is solid, solidified, and clung to. This is called the internal earth element. Now, both the internal earth element and the external earth element are simply earth element, and that should be seen as it actually is with proper wisdom Thus, this is not mine, this I am not, this is not myself. And when one sees it thus as it actually is with proper wisdom, one becomes disenchanted with the earth element and makes the mind dispassionate towards the earth element. Now, this and the next four chapters that I'm going to read is really a lesson in impartiality. You know, if we want to uh, work at reducing our own egotistical uh, tendencies or our own um, um, focus on ourselves, and sometimes it even shows up as being extremely shy. I'm too shy to talk to you. I'm too shy for this, and I'm too shy for that. But you have to really look at shyness. Shyness is a great focus on oneself, you know. 
And uh, although it comes off in a way that, that is not a demanding upon another, it's still uh, a very uh, a narrow, self-focused view. That's what I'm trying to say. So sometimes uh, uh, things are not always the way we look. It's not always going out that way, but it's also folding in and looking in this way and being uh, consumed with thoughts about, about ourselves. And so, so now it's nighttime. And he's been sitting all day, and he obviously didn't make that much progress, but he's been doing his mindfulness of breathing. Uh, but the operative words were of good uh, fruit and of good benefit. And so the Buddha talks to him about the four great elements. Now, this is why it's so important that we combine both our uh, practice on the pillow and uh, uh, which the Buddha actually in many places does not call practice. In one sutta specifically, he says, I don't even call that practice. I call that a pleasant abiding here and now. He said, this is what I call practice. And he goes into how we act when we're off the pillow, when someone accosts us, when someone curses us, when we don't get what we want. How do we respond? How do we act then? He said, that's, that, you know, that's where your practice is done. Uh, so, uh, so he's talking now about... Uh, what keeps your, the time that you're sitting on the pillow from being of good fruit and of benefit? So he's dealing with an obstacle for Rahula, the obstacle that he observed uh, that morning when he wrapped mine. He read the, uh, the uh, Rahula's thoughts, and he turned to him and talked to him about the vanity and the pride. And he was trying to lay an ax to the root before it got too bad, before, you know, it became something that would really create uh, difficulties for Ra Rahula. And so he goes on, uh, what Rahula is the water element? The water element may be either internal or external. If I had a glass of water uh, and I held it up and I asked what it was, you'd say a glass of water. But if I drank that water and asked about it, you wouldn't say it's water in this sack of skin. You'd say you know, it, it now gets absorbed into me. It's me. And the, and the Buddha is saying, look at this, look at this. Uh, what you're calling me, what you're calling my, what you're calling mine. He says, it's just the earth element. It's just the water element. And he goes on with the fire element. He goes on with the air element. And he goes on with the space element. And it's not... Um, in a certain sense that there is no you, there's like, like there's, uh, I'm definitely sitting in this chair, you know. But it's talking about how to, to uh, shift the mind and how to change your frame of reference so that we move away from our, our egocentric uh, understanding of a self and we can enlarge and, uh, and expand uh, and move into a place of impartiality. I mean, you can sit here and do the medicine to tell the cows come home, you know, but if you are, are not doing it from a space of impartiality, truly impartiality, then then it's not going to benefit you uh, that much. It's just blah, 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 blah. But in shifting the mind, sometimes we have to see how, yeah, that's really, that's really true. And so he says, Rahula, what is the water element? The water element may be e either internal or external. What is the internal water element? Whatever internally belonging to oneself is water, watery, and clung to. That is bile, phlegm, pus, blood, sweat, fat, tears, grease, sp spittle, snot, all of the joints, urine, or whatever else internally belonging to oneself that is water, watery, and clung to. This is called the internal water element. Now, both the internal water element and external water element are simply water element. And that should be seen as it actually is with proper wisdom. Thus, this is not mine. This I am not. This is not myself. And when one sees it as it actually is with proper wisdom, one becomes disenchanted with the water element and makes the mind dispassionate towards the water element. Now, these are two words we really don't like. We don't like the word disenchanted, and we don't like the word uh, dispassionate because we like to be enchanted, and we like to be passionate about things. Uh, so if those two words are a hindrance or a stumbling block for you, maybe you can look at them in a little different way. So 
Um, when we speak of becoming disenchanted, it's because we are so very enchanted uh, with ourselves or the notion of ourselves, even if it's not in a good way, you know. And so he's, he's trying to put a little loosening there, you know, so that we become a, a, a little bit detached from always viewing everything from an egocentric space looking out. That's, that's, that's it. And if you can accept it as that, then you don't have to do the year. But your mind hasn't go, doesn't need to go to clinging around your views and your thoughts about this. I want to say something about our thoughts and views around things. Sometimes we can't penetrate to uh, the meaning of something, the deep meaning, the liberating meaning, because we have such an objection to a particular word that's like rubbing us wrong or, you know, that, that we just have an aversion to because of somebody used it some time ago or because it meant a certain thing to us when we were 10 years old and we have just like shut down on the word. Then one good way to take the, uh, to take Dharmic uh, instruction for consideration is to just hold that word loosely. Maybe you can come up with um, a euphemism if you need that. Uh, or you can just not be so, um, uh, just accept the word as the word and stay with the, uh, the import of the message, what's important in the message. And don't make the whole message about that one that one word. And after a while, you can hear certain words, and they won't offend you because your ego won't be uh, it won't be so big. It won't be uh, riding you in that certain way. And you can hear these things and you say, "Up, oh, that's definitely me." <laughs> and you can just work on it. Okay. All right. So now he says, Rahula, what is the fire element? The fire element may be either internal or external. What is the internal fire element? Whatever internally belonging to oneself is fiery, fire, and clung to. That is, that by which one is warmed, ages, and is consumed. And that by which what is eaten, drunk, consumed, and tasted gets completely digested. Or whatever else internally belonging to oneself is fire, fiery, and clung to. This is called the internal fire uh, element. Now, both the internal fire element and the external fire element are simply fire element. And that should be seen as it actually is with proper wisdom. So first, in our sitting with these elements, we're sitting until we really see these parts of our body uh, just as they are, as earth, air, fire, wind, space. And with proper wisdom, we see thus, this is not mine, this I am not, this is not myself. When one sees it thus as it actually is with proper wisdom, one becomes disenchanted with the fire element and makes the mind dispassionate towards the fire element. What Rahula is the air element, the air element may be either internal or external. What is the internal air element? Whatever internally belonging to oneself is air, airy, and clung to. That is upgoing winds, downgoing winds, winds in the belly, winds in the bowels. Winds that course through the limbs, the in-breath and the out-breath, or whatever else internally belonging to oneself is air, airy, uh, and clung to. This is called the internal air element. Now, both the internal air element and the external air element are simply air element. And that should be seen as it actually is with proper wisdom. This is not mine. This I am not. This is not myself. And when one sees it thus as it actually is, uh, with proper wisdom, one becomes disenchanted with the air element and makes the mind dispassionate towards the air element. What Rahula is the space element? The space element may be either internal or external. What is the internal space element? Whatever internally belonging to oneself is space spatial and clung to, that is the holes of the ears, the nostrils, the door of the mouth, and that aperture whereby what is eaten, drunk, consumed, and tasted gets swallowed and where it collects and whereby it is excre excreted from below or whatever else internally belonging to oneself is space spatial and clung to. This is called the internal space element. Now both the internal space element and the external space element, a simply space element. And that should be seen as it actually is with proper wisdom thus. This is not mine. This I am not. 
this is not myself. And when one sees it as it actually is with proper wisdom, one becomes disenchanted with the space element and makes the mind dispassionate towards the space element. Rahula, develop meditation that is like the earth. For when you develop meditation that is like the earth, arisen agreeable and disagreeable contacts will not invade your mind and remain. Just as people throw clean things and dirty things, excrement, urine, spittle, pus, and blood on the earth, and the earth is not repelled, it is not humiliated, and it is not disgusted because of that. So too, Rahula, develop meditation that is like the earth. For when you develop meditation that is like the earth, arisen, agreeable, and disagreeable contacts will not invade your mind and remain. And so uh, there is a, a, a process of growth here. And uh, later on in the practice, it won't even invade your mind. You know, once impartiality has been reached, but until that time, these thoughts might invade your mind, but he said they won't invade the mind and remain. Because the more that we come to the conclusion, that is seeing with proper wisdom as it is, this is not mine, this I am not, this is not myself, then we will, uh, the thoughts will stop uh, occurring to the mind that this uh, is mine, this is me, this is myself. Uh, but in the meantime, he says that the thoughts may invade the mind, but they can't, they can't stay. And quick, more and more quickly, they will start to uh, fade away even when they arise until after a while they won't arise. And there you know you're reaching a state of impartiality. And what that does for you is it allows you to not think of oneself as more important than another. Uh, not think of oneself as better than another. Think of oneself as inferior to another. So uh, uh, that gets rid of so much suffering right there. Some of us suffer because we're arrogant, suffer because we feel in inferior, suffer because we feel invisible, suffering because, you know, but it's all related to our relationship with ourselves and a sense of, of a personal self. So you can see what this um, meditation and these objects of meditation are designed to do and, uh, and how to work with them. And remember now, the question was how to how to do mindfulness of breathing so that is is of good benefit and of good effect. And the Buddha's going through this whole litany of other things that he needs to focus on, um, uh, so that he can get into the place that when he sits, he can easily go uh, into uh, meditation. And then he goes on one last one. Rahula developed meditation. Uh, that is like the uh, fire. For when you develop meditation like that is like fire, arisen agreeable and disagreeable contacts will not invade your mind and remain. Just as people burn clean things and dirty things, excrement, urine, spittle, pus, and blood and fire, and the fire is not repelled, it's not humiliated, it's not disgusted. Because of that too, so Rahula developed meditation. That is like fire. And when you do, a, uh, a risen agreeable and disagreeable contacts will not invade your mind and remain. Now notice that he's speaking of disagreeable contacts, but he says also a risen agreeable contacts. Now and we're always thinking like uh, if we're thinking the best of people or we're thinking the best of ourselves and, and what's wrong with that? Actually there's nothing wrong with that. When the right balance is there and he's speaking of a kind of balance that puts us into a place that we don't have to think the best or the worst. You know, just being in a neutral ground, this whole idea of the middle way is so that uh, there's no agitation of the mind. You know, uh, uh, he said in one place when I'm thinking, you know, like terrible thoughts, the mind is agitated. When I'm thinking happy thoughts, and uh, you know, the mind is still agitated. There is still that agitation and the agitations uh, are what cause our highs and our lows. He's talking about being able to be on this either, uh, even plane where we're neither high nor are we low, but just this uh, balanced, uh, uh, um, uh, a very uh, balanced, clear type of, of walk, way of walking and being in the world. And so he goes on and he tells them that, uh, uh, and, and it revolves around those uh, three 
area. So we're looking about uh, at not being repelled, not being re humiliated, and not being disgusted. Just about everything that upsets us has to do with something that, that you know, we feel a sense of humiliation or shame about, or something we have an aversion to, and feeling repelled about, or something that we feel disgusted about. I mean, like, you get rid of that, you basically have no complaints. Uh, and remember, again, he says, not just those disagreeable uh, impulses and contacts, but also agreeable ones. The thing about getting too elated is that when that goes away, there's only one way to go, and that's down. And so it keeps us from having these lows if we don't have, if we don't have uh, these highs. And so he goes through that with the air and he goes through that with the space. And then when he's done all of that, you would think, well, okay, so now we're ready for mindfulness of breathing. Just, ah, 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 ah. Rahula, then develop meditation on loving kindness. But when you develop meditation on loving kindness, any ill will will be abandoned. So let's say that you have this uh, sense of, of uh, aversion towards something or disgusted about something, you know, and, uh, and that something is caused by someone. And so there's some ill will that arises. You know, so he says develop meditation on loving kindness. Loving kindness, loving, being kind. Extending kindness. Uh, uh, you know, every single one of us could use a little mercy here and there. Just being able to grant, you know, sometimes when you uh, commit an offense, and it could have been a very egregious one, and you own it, you own it. And yet in owning it, you still feel that there's some space of time then that that gets um, uh, neutralized. You know, but if somebody was saying, oh, no, that thing you did, oh, no, that thing you did, you know, at some point you'd be saying, enough already, you know. Uh, at some point you would want that to be absolved of that. Uh, and so it's that way. Can you, can you overlook a fault? Can you overlook a slight? Can you forgive somebody? I mean, quickly, while you're in, in the way. I mean, turning to the left and turning to the right, you know, and uh, that's, that's, kind of what that means about turning turning the other cheek. It's, it's being able to really overlook a slight or a fault. And who knows how you can change uh, someone's uh, way of thinking or someone's way of view just by the way you handle their slight, by the way you handle their insult. Where uh, uh, battling for your opinion or your viewer or getting them straight will, will may never uh, alter uh, they really might say, well, I don't really care if it does or not. But here's the thing, you know, everything we do, every action we take, every thought we have, you know, as we move up this ladder towards awakening should be about saving living beings. And, uh, and so it requires then that we put them on par with ourselves. And that's what this is all about, breaking down uh, that great sense of ourselves, whether it's... Uh, you know, on the upside or whether it's on the downside, feeling inferior. So it's like what I love about the Dharma is if, if you're too high, it brings you down. If you're too low, it, it brings you up. Um, and so he goes on and says, Rahula, if you develop meditation on love and kindness, any ill will will be abandoned. So that is one uh, remedy then f if ill will has invaded your mind, how what you can do so that that it cannot remain. Rahula, develop meditation on altruistic joy. And I like to think of that as appreciation, deep appreciation for others. For when you develop meditation on altruistic joy, any discontent will be abandoned. Rahula, develop meditation on equanimity. For when you develop meditation on equanimity, any aversion will be developed, abandoned. Rahula, develop meditation on foulness. For when you develop meditation on foulness, any lust will be abandoned. So now he's talking about uh, the four Brahma Viharas. And these are, are mental states, uh, mental uh, attitudes that promote a certain uh, um, mental state. And he talks about loving kindness, loving being kind, you know, um, willing to extend uh, uh, forgiveness, mercy, grace, a break, 
uh, to someone else the same way that you would want that extended to yourself. Even when you own your stuff, you know, at some point, then you feel that that you are absolved of that. You've paid your dues, you've made recompense, or 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 you just learn from your mistake. But at some point, when does the condemnation end? Is what I'm saying. So in cultivating a mind of loving kindness, we can more quickly get to that place. And then we can move beyond that place where our loving kindness will uh, will pervade a circumstance. You know, so sometimes it's saying to a person, you know, you don't have to leave mad, but you do have to go. You know, it's in that way that you can do some of the tough things that have to be done. And yet you don't have to wait and get angry to, to do it. And it's not just a matter of tempering the speech so that you can speak calmly, but inside you're boiling or inside you're detached, but that you can be full frontal there with uh, everything that's coming with that moment. And yet, and yet, the loving kindness can carry the moment. It can handle the moment. The same with compassion. So uh, loving kindness neutralizes ill will. Compassion neutralizes cruelty. Cruelty is kind of like, you know, when you like just really want to stick it to someone, you know, and you start thinking up in your mind all the little things that you could do, or uh, it's just a, uh, uh, it's kind of wanting someone to suffer. It's not being angry with someone. It's not having. It's it's a different kind of emotion and response than ill will that has an, ele uh, an element of causing harm or deep suffering to another, pain, causing pain to another. And so you can kind of get that. So you can look within oneself, you know, and someone may have that little tinge of, of cruelty. Like I, I can't like just uh, say, no, you can't have it or no, you can go, but I like to, or or, but I like to like stick it to you in a way that really causes you to hurt, you know, and seeing if that little bit of cruelty is in you. Rahula developed meditation on altruistic joy. Altruistic joy then, or deep appreciation for others. Or this is the thing about altruistic joy. You know, some days I have a good day and some days I have a, you know, not so good day. And uh, even when my day is not going good, somebody somewhere is having a good day. So if I can learn to rejoice in other people's good days, then I'm not so overcome by what's uh, disturbing in my day. I can handle this little bit of, of uh, discomfort or, or uh, it produces less disease when I'm balancing that with something that's happening uh, in someone else's life. You know, and if I don't know something specific, I know that everywhere, every second, something good is happening in somebody's life. And just learn to turn the mind to that, to just be a, a, a balancer for you when you're undergoing a particularly rough day. You know, this is, uh, this is how we train. And we started in meditation, uh, and then we practice it out there uh, in, in daily life. The same for uh, equanimity. Equanimity, if we haven't done these uh, preliminary things and we don't have some glimpse of, of the equality of beings, uh, it's very difficult, I dare say impossible, to enter into equanimity. You may end up being not concerned about someone else. You may be aloof and uh, detached in that uh, uh, but that's not equanimity. You know, it's not, uh, I, I regret that some of the Buddhist terms were uh, translated in a certain way because here, at least in the United States, we already have a definition for that word. And it sort of gives a negative connotation rather than a liberating one when we talk about uh, detachment. But don't think of it as being cut off from in, uh, in a certain way, but it means not caught up in, and that's different than being cut off uh, from. It means that you can be there in that circumstance, you know. There can be uh, an empathy for a person, and there can uh, be a recognition 
of a situation without us being all caught up in it or having to like just cut ourselves off and be detached from it to not feel something, to not experience something. And this will then enable you to be uh, really in a circumstance that your presence can make a difference uh, when other people are, um, um, are having difficulty, when they're having great av aversion. It'll help you to stand your uh, stand on a, uh, a st be on stable gra grounded and um, honest, but yet with a certain uh, both uh, uh, dignity and ability to talk through the situation with someone else when when their mind is just going crazy or when they're overcome with grief, you know, and that you don't have to fall down into the hole with with them. Um, Rahula, develop meditation on the perception of impermanence. For when you develop meditation on the perception of impermanence, the conceit I am will be abandoned. And so he starts this um, kind of imp impartiality and kind of, of uh, equality in having us look uh, at the elements that make up the composition of form. But remember he said form and feeling and perception and uh, consciousness. Uh, he's talking about um, not just that part of us that we consider the physical body, but every aspect. And, and we should do the same thing um, and you remember now, Rahul is 18 years old, so he's been walking with uh, the Buddha for a, little, for a little while. So he doesn't have to break this down into kindergarten, you know. Uh, so there may be some terms that you're not familiar with. I love Google. Just Google the terms. You can, you can uh, supplement your, uh, your learning in so many ways by having enough interest to do some extra investigation. Uh, uh, so that you come to expand your your knowledge of the Dharma in terms of the Dharma uh, and how the different aspects uh, interrelate. Um, that's part of the joy of the of the journey, and it's an enlightenment factor. The enlightenment factor of investigation. Then he goes on and he says. Uh, Beyond the four Brahma Viharas, you know, uh, getting into a certain state of mind, fostering a certain attitude about how to uh, look at things and uh, understand things. He says, Rahula, develop meditation on foulness. For when you develop meditation on foulness, any lust will be abandoned. Now, I don't say that everyone should do that particular meditation uh, at, at any given time. There are particular situations that this is a good one. Um, for people who, you know, have a hard time facing reality, uh, this could be uh, a good meditation to do. I know so many people that are so flighty and so ungrounded, they just see happy, happy, happy everywhere because that's all they want to see. But that's, uh, you know, when we talk about being balanced, we have to be able to see the beautiful and the ugly and hold uh, either one of them with the same kind of, of stability, you know, and peacefulness. Uh, I also wouldn't suggest that one for a person who's depressed, you know, because they need to balance the thoughts in the mind uh, that are producing uh, the state of depression with other thoughts that will neutralize or, com or combat that. So we do need to know what we need to be meditating on, and, and we'll de develop more skill with this as we uh, as we go on uh, through this uh, processes of investigation and and uh, particularly of the different meditation uh, objects, he says. Um, here we go to the uh, uh, developing meditation on the perception of impermanence. The conceit I am will be abandoned. So here it's more like there's no fixed me at any time, and. Um, second by second, by nanosecond, by infinitesimal sec nanosecond, 
we're constantly changing cells are being birthed and cells are dying you know thoughts are rising and and uh passing away so um there's all of these different movements occurring in both the body and in the mind so the conceit i am is any kind of fixed entity fixed thing this is me is really uh, a muddled view it's it's uh it's not a correct a correct view so although we seem permanent you know actually there is nothing permanent or stable anywhere and after all of this is done we have trained we're training in this then he says Rahula developed meditation on mindfulness of breathing. When meditation, of, when mindfulness of breathing is developed and cultivated, it is of great fruit and great benefit. And how is mindfulness of breathing developed and cultivated? So it is of great fruit and great benefit. Uh, great benefit. We're going to discuss that in when in our discourse uh, one eighteen Anapanasati. Uh, Sutta. And so I'm not going to repeat it here um, uh, because we'll get into it in a lot of detail in that Sutta. But if you printed out Sutta number 62, you have it up on your screen or whatever, read uh, the rest of the Sutta, which is about uh, mindfulness of breathing. The one thing in particular that I want you to note, though, is it starts with here, Rahula. A bhikkhu gone to the forest or to the root of a tree or to a meditation center or, you know, in a hut or in your bedroom or whatever. Sits down, having folded his legs crosswise, set his body erect, or sitting on a chair with body erect, right? Uh, and establish mindfulness in front of him. That means bringing uh, all of his uh, sense of of self right here to this task at hand. I'm focusing on this for the next five minutes, 15 minutes, 30 minutes, whatever. He's coming, he's coming uh, here to do this work, to do this training, you know. Uh, and he says, ever mindful he breathes in, and mindful he breathes out. And breathing in long he understands. I breathe in long, breathing in, uh, breathing out long he understands, I breathe out long. Breathing in short, he understands I breathe in short. And breathing out short, he understands I breathe out short. Now, he's not asking you to do anything. He's just saying you just understand that this was a, a short breath compared to the last one. This was a long breath. This is a subtle breath. This is a harsh breath. You know, this is a smooth breath. This is a rugged breath. It's just uh, drawing in the sense gates until you're like just only concerned with what you have decided to focus on. And in this particular uh, uh, incidence, it is mindfulness of breathing, being mindful of the in-breath and the out-breath. And that's all that he's asking you to do until you just become aware of that and can stick with that. You know, take two breaths and then your mind's across town. You know, you bring it back. Take two breaths and you're wondering about dinner. And you bring it back. So, no good. You can't go anywhere. You just have to stay with that breath until you uh, are committed to just observing breath by breath. It was a long breath. That was a short breath. That was a short breath. That was a, a long breath. That was a, a, a coarse breath. That was a smooth breath. That was, you know, just, uh, and just... Uh, as you've done the breath, you've identified long or short, and and then you get to the place that you just understand. Now we don't have to we don't have to talk about it. We don't you know I know I understand that was a long breath. It's just the long breath, the short breath. You're with the long, the short, the the short, the the uh, smooth, the rugged, the coarse, the subtle, and you're just there with it, just there with it. And just developing the capacity and the ability to just be there with the breath. And if you could do that for five minutes, that's so wonderful. Just to truly, truly, 100% be there. It's better than sitting for 45 minutes, you know, and your mind has been all over town. So don't despise small beginnings. Get it right. 
you know, stay there with that. And we will pick up the rest of the instructions because the next one starts with uh, breathing. He trains thus. And then he goes into the training. So you know then that we're not just sitting there letting go for a while, not sitting there relaxing. We are coming to train. Thank you.